you're watching Video Game Subscription Wars, I'm Sam and I'm here to give you a taste of the best first person shooters on PlayStation Now. Have you heard about the channel? Here I cover and compare video game subscriptions and all the games they have to offer to help you decide which is the best for you. If this video touches you, or if you smell something fishy, let me know in the comments below and if that all makes sense, let's get on with the video. Today I'm talking strictly first person, so no third person games that include the ability to zoom in. The focus also needs to be on guns, so no combination of ranged and melee weapons, or ranged weapons and psychic stroke magic abilities. Also, if it's got shooting, but it's more aligned with a different genre, like an RPG, I'm putting it in my pocket to return to later on. If you like any of the games you just saw though, they are all on PS Now. With that distinction, I can actually cover every single FPS on PlayStation Now in this video. Some of them may only get a mention rather than a full-on review, but that's still a first for this series, because in previous genres I've had to miss out about half the games. This also means that I'm not just covering the best FPSs. You may see some bad ones, well, you will see some bad ones, but hey, I'm ready if you are, let's do it. I had a feeling I'd struggle to find an online match in a game that's over five years old, especially one published by EA. Here's my experience with Battlefield 4, and here's Battlefield Hardline. So not a great start. Let me know if you guys have had any trouble with this, or if it's just me. Uh, I thought it was originally because you needed a PlayStation Plus account to play online with PlayStation Now, but that's not the case, so I don't know what it is but it's probably something to do with this. But that's okay, I've got other military shooters to play, like Operation Flashpoint Dragon Rising. This is a tactical class-based shooter where you, oh, oh, okay. Maybe Operation Flashpoint Red River. That's the newer game, after all, so, okay. All these games have single-player campaigns, but there are far better story-based shooters to play. <laughs> I think FPS campaigns take one of two routes, realism or action. Here's what I mean. The Metro series is based on Dmitry Gulkovsky's series of novels and takes the classic post-apocalyptic survival horror story into the realm of FPS. Earth's surface is now a radioactive wasteland and the new home to the ominous Dark Ones. The few humans left alive are driven underground and the people of Moscow live in the city's metro tunnels. With its roots in survival horror, Metro includes the expected dark and drab atmosphere, monsters that range from spooky to terrifying and barely enough ammo to shoot them with. Particularly for me, as I chose the Ranger difficulty, which removes the heads-up display, ups the damage I both give and take, and makes ammo even more sparse. It's survival horror to the extreme. It only takes a couple shots to kill enemies, just one if you can get them in the head. So it's all about making every bullet count, especially in Metro, as military grade bullets are also the currency of the underground. I can load them into the chamber when times get desperate, but I'll remove any hope of a weapon or health upgrade later on. So most times I put myself in the corner fired my empty revolver and prayed to whatever god exists in this universe that the AI would pull us through. With no heads up display, keeping track of the things I have is cleverly blended into my first person view. It's very engaging to not have a single piece of information overlaid on the screen, and small details like wiping my gas mask clean and looking at my watch to check air levels only deepens the immersion. You play as Artyom, who in typical FPS fashion never utters a word and has no legs. The story instead progresses through the supporting cast who, barring the occasionally questionable voice acting, What the hell just happened to me? Artyom, did you hear those songs? Urgh, I wouldn't wish it on an enemy. Are integral to the game because they have unlimited ammo. In Metro 2033, my friend's deep pockets caused me to stick to them like glue, which actually helped dictate the pace of the game. It's virtually impossible to steamroll through a level, so I had to follow along behind, checking corners and finding safe places to fight off mutants. Eventually, of course, you are left to fend for yourself, and that's when things get really difficult, as I would inevitably run out of ammo and have no choice but to helplessly flee from everything trying to kill me. 
It's at those times that, ideally missed, the gravelly voice of a man who, despite the apocalypse, still manages to smoke 40 cigarettes a day. Absolutely. Despite the added difficulty, I'd recommend the Ranger mode as it's the perfect fit for the tone of the game. Just know that that's what you're in for, potentially getting frustrated at moments where there's no ammo, no medkits, and seemingly no hope. <laughs> I could show you a clip like this. And say that Wolfenstein is the polar opposite to Metro. Which is true, I suppose. Both these games have you fighting Nazis, but Wolfenstein is the only one where your legs don't work so you have to lie on a conveyor belt to shoot them. And while the biggest moments of the Wolfenstein games are, again, things like this. You're just another... The over-the-top violence isn't everything that it has to offer. Stealth is a significant factor. Silently taking down Nazi officers so they don't raise the alarm to your presence will avoid several restarts. I never needed to worry about ammo, but I did need to be mindful of my positioning. Shooting from cover is key to staying alive, and enemies move to your last known position if you drop out of sight, which can create tactical flanking opportunities, which the AI will also do to you if you stay in one place for too long. Even on the lower difficulties, opting for the Rambo method will often end in your death. It's kind of a weird juxtapose for the game, where stealth sections conclude with getting a weapon that can disintegrate people. But the more tactical elements are a welcome change of pace from Wolfenstein's trigger-happy baseline. There are some pretty severe difficulty spikes, and although you have the option to switch the difficulty whenever you want, it's not like I want to do that. There's a neat perk system to upgrade Billy Blaskovitz, who, unlike Artyom, does actually speak. His voice actually might be even huskier. Never seen true cruelty. Until now. He also magically sprouts legs between games to banish that FPS protagonist stereotype. Like Metro, I highly recommend the Wolfenstein games. Again, as long as you know what you're gonna get. Is there even one drop of realism in these games? You right, Blasco? I've been better, but I think I got the blood stopped now. But there is a decent story to accompany the solid shooting mechanics in high octane Nazi slaying. <laughs> If you want an online FPS experience in PS Now, your best bet is co-op, and you have two options. You can do the smart thing and play Borderlands. You might not get a full four-man squad in Borderlands 2 through matchmaking. You might not get anywhere in the pre-sequel. But fortunately, Borderlands is fun enough to play alone. It just gets better the more people you have. And if you team up with your friends, there's a huge amount of gun-toting fun to be had. So, if you have friends, I'd recommend Borderlands. And um, let me know where you get your friends from, because I could do with a couple. Or you can do the stupid thing and play Payday 2, like I did. Again, I managed to join a couple of people to play through a heist, and not once did I understand what was going on. I thought there would at least be a semi-methodical approach to these heists, but it was just a manic shootout, and I don't mean that in a good way. I'm not sure if that's the fault of the game, or because I was playing with random people, or both, but on the bright side, I leveled up 28 times in one heist, so I was able to buy this cool panda mask and never intend to play this game again. Look, we've got so many aliens to shoot. You can shoot them in Alien Rage, you can shoot them in Resistance 3, you can shoot them in Rage, you can shoot them in Duke Nukem Forever, but why would you shoot any of them when you can shoot demons in Doom? While Wolfenstein uses stealth to add variety to its combat, you won't find any of that here. Doom adds variety by doubling down on just how far you can push the limits of fast, adrenaline-fueled shooting. Doom's level design, combat and movement are tightly blended, making every stage a sandbox for the different ways you can chain attacks together in impressively gruesome ways. It's all up to you how you approach a level. So when you get to this part here, right, what you want to do is glory kill this guy for some health, shoot his friend, uh, spin around the wrong way for some style points, unload your missiles onto this guy here, 
shoot at this uh, guy with the laser, stun him a bit, then get out the chainsaw, yeah, run right through him, that's going to give you a big ammo drop, um, then you want to shoot this guy, then decide to shoot the barrel for area of effect, because it does more damage, looks cool, then things are going to start getting hairy, so we switch to shotgun, lay out those two guys, going to miss that shot, but that's cool, um, we're going to switch to plasma rifle instead, he's already dead, shoot that guy, miss some shots there, throw a grenade over there, uh, see what that does, shoot that guy, get the glory kill, the grenade stun them, switch to the rocket launcher, because that looks fun. Shoot those guys. Go up here. Grab the quad damage. We're going to need that because a crazy bitch is about to come in. Uh, shoot that guy. Go for the lock on here. Don't really get it. Shoot the floor. There's the crazy bitch I was talking about. Uh, switch to the assault rifle. Try and load, unload all the missiles on her. She's still alive. Um, we're going to try that again. She's still alive. Still pissing around. Um, so we're going to go for the shotgun instead. Switch to the shotgun and bam. Triple shot right to the face. Dude. With Doom Eternal just released, now is a great time to go back and appreciate how a first person shooter can become a puzzle game, where timing and reflexes are key to seeing just how many different ways you can animate killing a demon. Also the multiplayer almost works, almost, we were close. Well it, it does work, and there's just no one playing this game. You can hope for better luck than me, but I think you'll have a better time in the campaign to be honest. <laughs> Shooting people is the typical FPS mold, and I will preface this section by saying that I didn't care very much for any of these games, so I'll keep this brief. I remember Killzone as PlayStation's FPS challenger to Halo around that time. I never played it back then, so while I'm sure it was better at the time, it hasn't aged very well. That's not really a knock on Killzone, I just think that every FPS has quite a short window of relevancy. So, while fans of the series will surely appreciate it being on here, I don't have that much to say about it. Brink's campaign is simply a series of missions, each with a very small amount of context. They are mission based because you're supposed to play them online, but I'm pretty sure these games aren't with real people. Yeah, yeah, pretty sure I'm playing with bots. So, I guess no one else is playing this game, and honestly, not that surprising. Okay, what the f*** is going on here? Red Faction Guerrilla Remastered is on PS now, and I remember this game having pretty impressive, destructible environments for its time. But did you know that the first two Red Faction games were first person shooters? And did you know that they were terrible? Because now you do. I got him, take the fire. I got him. Did I get him? I think I got him. Come here, man. Oh, yeah, I got him. <laughs> yeah, take that bitch. <laughs> oh, no. Come on. Come on, old Kilda. Yeah, get out of here. Yeah, you want some? Get the fuck out of here. This is a man's game. Come on, twin the big leagues. Come on. Oh, double. Get out of here, boy. Oh, it's 1v1, just me and him. Oh. Oh. Who's that? Oh. <laughs> 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 guys over at Quick Tequila Games clearly said, hey guys, let's have a quick five tequilas before we make Lovely Planet, and this is the result. I actually quite like the pace of things, especially when you learn how to lock on, which for some reason is explained at like level eight instead of right at the start, but maybe they wanted to give you time to get used to this really awkward way that you move around. It's kind of hard to explain, but you feel very floaty. Overall, this isn't awful, but I also wouldn't spend more than like 20 minutes playing it. Man, don't you just love on-rail shooters? You know when the developer decides to just take out movement? The key piece of interaction with a game. The thing that makes you feel like you're actually in control Enemy of the contact. action on screen. I love it when they just say nope. We don't need that. Well, the exception is obviously in arcade games, and the House of the Dead series is a classic arcade title. I think these console ports were originally for the Wii, which kind of makes sense because you can use the infrared capabilities of the Wii remote. But you can't do that here, so I really don't see the point in playing this. Heavy Fire Afghanistan skipped the arcade altogether and went straight to the Wii, 
and has now somehow wound up on PlayStation Now, and boy, are we pleased about that. Pick up the med kit! Quick Tequila Games may have been drunk when they made Lonely Planet, but no... no! Yeah, that's the name of the developer. You know, new the minds behind games like Cube Heads 2 and My Postcards for the Nintendo DS? Yeah, well, they were on crack when they made Blast and Bunnies. You can use the DualShock 4 motion controls to aim your carrot cannon in this endless wave-based shooter, which is actually really difficult unless you get the heat-seeking raspberry gun early on. You can disable motion controls to make life easier, but then you'd be playing this for longer, so I don't recommend doing that. And finally, Hunter's Trophy 2 is the most tactical game on this list. I spent 45 minutes quickscoping ducks and geese before I learned how to track a rabbit, following its footsteps for 10 minutes before finding its burrow, and accidentally shooting two of them at once because the reticle is the size of a melon. Apparently, shooting more than one rabbit is poor hunter etiquette. The same doesn't apply for coyotes though, I mean you can f***ing go to town on these things. But if you thought I was just here to track rabbits, you're sorely mistaken. I was only whetting my appetite for the hunt. I then unlocked the doggy, which opens up a whole new level of tracking animals. Using the keen senses of my doggy, you can finally track down that elusive turkey. And oh, for f**k's sake. That's every FPS on PlayStation Now covered. Done. Completed it. And while I'd only recommend these games, that's just me. I mean, play whatever you like the look of. It's your subscription. But it is worth mentioning the online, um, at least for me, on these games was a bit of a wasteland. And I don't think that's necessarily PlayStation's fault, like from a technical perspective. I just think that the slate of games that they have are quite dated, so there isn't a player base for them. Which is fine. I think PlayStation now, at least at the moment, is predominantly a single player focused service. And that works for me. But like I said, that's just me, and let me know in the comments below your experience playing online games on PlayStation Now, what it's been like. As always, thanks for watching, uh, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you on the next one. Cheers.